All right, it's time for a patron review for Mike, who requested Madman, the slasher from 1981 about a guy named Madman Mars going on a killing spree in the woods near a camp for gifted children. This was my third time watching it, and I saw it for the first time a couple years ago, watched it again for my you know, top 10 of 1981, did not make my list, uh, but yeah, my thoughts on it haven't really changed all that much on a third viewing, and I th think that this movie has just as many good things going for it as bad. And what are those bad things? Well, first up is I don't like the fact that this camp for gifted children uh, has only f four or five kids there. Like, why is there only four? Like, this movie seems to be limited by a very small budget. I didn't look it up, but I would imagine it was only a couple hundred thousand or a few hundred. Like, it had to be around the same as, like, Halloween or Friday the 13th. I imagine it's that small because it feels small budget. Like, there's hardly any kids at this camp. They never feel in danger, and no kids die in this movie. So, missed opportunity there. It's not like you can argue, well, and, you know, like you came for Jason Voorhees. Like, oh, you know, Jason wouldn't kill kids, and you can't say that about Madman Mars because we see that story about Madman Mars and how he murdered his children. He had two kids. He killed them. So he can kill kids. He's killed them before. Why isn't he killing them now? <laughs> like, I wanted to see some kids die. Missed opportunity. Another thing that is bad about this movie is the amount of filler and the pacing. The pacing is pretty slow. I think that the movie just keeps cutting to Rishi walking through the woods way too many times. There's sequences that just feel unnecessary, and there's just too much woods. It Again, low budget. It feels like they had two locations. Uh, make that three. They had, like, maybe this camp for one day, and then they had Madman Mars' house. Uh, maybe that was a set they built, and all the money went there. Because the rest of the movie is just shot at the third location, which is the woods. Just all woods. And... Every scene in the woods is like lit differently from the other one. You can see the sun in the background in a lot of shots. So the cinematography is just not good. It's very inconsistent. Like some scenes are lit with like a very hot like spotlight. Like it's a very harsh white light that's shining and like illuminating the entire forest. And then another shot right after that, it's like a blue light that they're using. Like they keep using different lights every day on this set. It's just like keep it consistent looking keep the look of the film the same you know and another thing about the film is the transfer was a bit distracting at times there's like this claw mark it's almost as if madman mars himself went into like the projector booth took the film reel and it was like scratching like the the film has like claw marks through the screen from time to time it was very distracting another thing that was distracting was uh the women in this movie are not attractive. Um, you know, call me sexist. I don't care. Like, uh, slasher movies are usually known for having nudity and very beautiful ladies, uh, you know, getting chased and killed and taking their top off from time to time. We don't get that in this movie. And there's so, yeah, you got no nudity, but you get some guy ass. And it, these women just don't do it for me. They're very unattractive. And one of them is. The lady from Dawn of the Dead, forgive me for not knowing her name, I've only seen that movie once, Galen Ross, I'm going to take a shot, am I close? Um, she's our final girl, and I don't like her. She's in the movie for like three minutes, and then she disappears for the whole second act because it's just one person going out in the woods looking for someone else, they get killed. Person number two goes out looking for person number one, they get killed, and then person number three goes out looking for person number one and two, if that person gets killed, and then person number four, it's rinse and repeat. The story's a bit repetitive. And I don't like Madman Mars being barefoot. It's a small complaint, but I just thought that was stupid. Like, the guy has shoes. Why can't he wear shoes? <laughs> like, in the, the story we were hearing and seeing in the open, he was wearing shoes. Now he's just this, like monstrous like caveman like dude who doesn't wear 
shoes and growls like a monster, like some kind of animal. Like, I don't care for the growling. I would rather just have him, like, grunt and be, like, pissed off. But the animal growl, like, I don't care for the growling. I don't care for the bare feet. And I don't care for his face makeup. Like, it's, again, inconsistent. The makeup on his face, it kind of changes. In one shot, it looks like actual, like, you know, prosthetics. Like, they put this makeup on his face for a few hours, like, did the best they could to make him look like a monster. And then in one shot, they just put this very quick, cheap mask over his face. Like, it looks like just they threw a mask on him real quick. And it doesn't look like makeup anymore. So it's like, mask, makeup, mask, make It's just... It's so inconsistent. But going back to the final girl, I think I kind of lost track there of what I was trying to say. I was talking about who the actress was, but her character. I, I, She's barely in the movie, and then when she does come back into the movie in the third act, she's kind of a dumb, weak final girl. Like, she's trying to be brave, but there's just this pathetic fight between her and Madman Mars that wasn't as long as it should have been. Um... I just, I just thought her character could have been more developed and more interesting, more of a badass, make smarter decisions. She does some questionable things. And also, there is some terrible ADR. Getting into what I like about the movie, though, is I like the opening title card and the electronic score of the movie that kicks in right away, saying, Madman Mars, and we get this, like, song. Madman Mars has his own, like, song that plays at the beginning and the end, and it just sets this cheesy tone like this movie is very cheesy like unintentionally i believe it has all these weird moments throughout that i had a little chuckle at um i did like the one character max i thought he was the best character i thought he was probably the best actor in the movie also and it's just unfortunate that he's one of those characters that just leaves the camp and doesn't really come back until the end so i wish he was in the movie more I did kind of like the other girl, um, I blanked on her name, not Ellie, the other one, Betsy, no, that's the final girl, whatever the other chick's name was, uh, the one who knows how to fix a car, uh, that one, I liked her, she had some little funny moments, and also, I like that there's a lot of, like, creepy shots of Madman Mars in the woods, like, hanging out in trees, uh, running around, there's a cool, like, backlit shot of him that they use sh twice in this movie, actually, so I guess they liked it so much also that they're like, we're going to use this shot again towards the end. Um, and the kills are actually kind of brutal. I like the kills in the like flashback story. Uh, those were pretty cool. Like You get some cool like close-up gore shots and some axe kills and a couple of beheadings and some aftermath shots. and like There's some decent gore here. And the kills are a bit creative. And, you know, the sound design with the kills was kind of cool. Like, the sound of the bones breaking. Like, he's snapping dudes, like, their backs and necks. Like, the sound design of that was pretty effective. So I liked that. And there's, like, one really cool jump scare that got me. And so, yeah, man, I talked about the score of the movie. I like the score in the open and, like, during some of the jump scares, like, the stinger sounds like the electronic sound to it, it's very 80s. But then there's a lot of moments where it just kind of is playing so quietly beneath the action that's happening that you barely notice it. Like, you would have to really, like, focus in, like, wait, I think I hear music playing over the scene. It should be louder. Like, why are they lowering the volume of the music so low? Like, crazy shit will be happening, there's, like, an intense moment, someone's fighting for their life, and you can barely make out the soundtrack of the movie. Like, it's barely playing. Like, turn that up. And lastly, I really dig the whole legend of Madman Mars, like, the crimes that he committed, and, you know, how the townspeople uh, found him at a bar after he just murdered his whole family uh, in their sleep, kind of like Amityville, just axed them in their beds, and then went to the bar and put the bloody axe on the bar and just ordered a shot of whiskey and then they just took his ass and hung him from a tree and then his body was missing the next day so it's like kind of left open throughout the movie like is he a ghost is he dead like is this like victor crowley hey uh is this like victor crowley like he's a ghost or is he just 
uh, monster who's been living out there. You know, like Jason Voorhees in part two, like he's just been living out in the woods. He's still technically human, just like a monster, though, just growling and long fingernails and nasty feet. Like, I don't know, like by the end of the movie, I'm not quite sure. Like, is he Victor Crowley or is he Jason Voorhees in part two? Like, what, what are they going for exactly here? I kind of like that they leave it open. So final thoughts, this is like cult classic slasher that obviously was just quickly capitalizing on the popularity of the slasher genre in the early 80s and is somewhat entertaining for people who are fans of that subgenre. It has the kills that you would want and the awesome macabre origin story for the killer, but it just has some weak pacing and a weak final girl and some bad cinematography that just prevents this movie from being one of the best slashers of the early 80s. So when it comes to Madman, I'll give this three out of five. All right, spoiler discussion. So uh, we open up at this camp for gifted children, uh, just five children really. And what do they mean by gifted? These children, they don't seem gifted. Like I thought that meant like they have some kind of disability. Like, these kids look like normal kids that aren't gifted in any way, shape, or form. They're just normal kids. So it's like, what? how are they gifted? And the editing was really weird during this campfire song that TP is singing. Um, as he's singing, they are, like, splicing in, like, little images and clips of what's going to happen to them later on in the movie. You get to see, like, their bodies being dragged around later on in the third act. So it's like, we get to see what's going to happen later. So that's kind of spoiling the movie in the opening two minutes. Um, so I wasn't crazy about that edit. And then I thought it was kind of funny that he's telling this, uh, Max, he's telling this very dark, disturbing story about Man Man Mars, whose house apparently is only a stone throws away, a distance away. Like, he's telling this story to these little kids, these gifted kids, that would be terrified of that story. And even the final girl kind of gives him shit later on, so I kind of like that. Because I was thinking, like, man, this is a terrible story to tell to these children who still have one more week to stay here. Yeah, so he tells the story about how you can't say Madman Mars above a whisper. And, you know, his house is right over there. And he... Of course, Richie stands up and starts yelling the name and then picks up a rock and throws it, I guess, so far that it goes through the the window of Mars's house. Like, So they're that close. Their campfire is that close to the house of this killer. And like, how long has it been since his body went missing? I would hope it's been very long that they would think he's dead by now because if his body is, is missing and he's still like alive like why would you open up this camp right next to that guy's house like have and they've never like searched that house the police like his body went missing and no one ever thought to go look at the house in the basement and like i don't know i feel like you could poke some serious holes in this plot um but yeah so he throws a rock through the window and i have to wonder what exactly is pissing off Madman Mars and making him go on his killing spree now. Because, like I said, this camp has been open all season. They're down to their last week now. So he's he's been avoiding them. He's been, he's been leaving them alone for weeks. And now uh, I'm wondering if it was the rock that he threw that is making him go on this killing spree, that's making him aware that they're there. Is he just now realizing that this camp is there somehow? Or was it the fact that he was yelling his name, Man Man Mars, that is making him aware that they're there? Or was it, or is he even really human? Is he a ghost? And the fact that he yelled out his name brought him back to life in that moment? I don't know. So anyways, so this guy, Dippy, I guess he's like the cook. He has no lines in the movie, but... I thought it was weird that the flute girl, she just wakes him up with her flute only to tell him, hey, the bottle of liquor that you were drinking before you passed out is now empty, and then just walks away. Like, 
You're going to wake him up to tell him that, and then he just gets up, goes around the corner, opens up a door, there's Madman Mars. It's actually a pretty good jump scare. And a cool kill. It's pretty gory. He claws his throat right off. He's got like these nasty fingernails, and he just rips his throat out really quickly. Then we get this freaky ass shot of Madman Mars in the trees looking at Richie. And if I was Richie, I would shit my pants. But instead, uh, Richie, he's so brave, or you could argue dumb, he goes into Madman Mars' house by himself. Man, the balls on this guy. And so, um, <laughs> we get this public apology. Like, they have like this fight at the campfire so then later on uh tp is saying to betsy in front of all the other counselors like i just want to make a public apology for my behavior earlier that, that should have just been a fight between us you guys didn't need to witness that i'm so sorry and then they all start clapping like he has like a full like, a round of applause from everybody like genuine like they're actually it wasn't like sarcastic like they're making fun of them like oh huh, huh, sit down you over dramatic idiot they're like actually clapping for this jackass just thought that was so silly and then right after that scene it just cuts to them making up and making love in this uh, hot tub to the world's cheesiest love song i've ever heard and the guy singing this song can't sing for shit I also find it funny that TP has his name on his belt. Is his name really TP? Or is that just like his initials? Like he has his initials or his name on his belt. And the flute girl is having trouble climbing up a hill and almost gets grabbed by Man Man Mars. And then when she gets to the top of the hill, she turns around, looks at the hill, and blows a fart at it. Like, ha ha, I, you know, I beat you. I managed to get up the hill and you couldn't keep me downhill. Like, <laughs> like what? <laughs> like, fuck you, Hill. I made it. It was so stupid. I, it made me like that character a little bit more. And so then, like, right after that, we get this odd scene that is just really unnecessary. It's the four counselors, one of them the girl who was just a second ago blowing a fart at a hill, all four of these counselors are just lying down on the ground with their heads all side by side. And they're just like looking up at the ceiling. They're just talk it seems like they're on drugs. And this guy starts going on this crazy like monologue. Like he gives this really crazy speech about how like, you know, he, he like whips out his knife. And I think he's talking about how like at any moment he could just like snap and kill them or something like that. And then it's all just a joke to scare them at the end. Like, oh, I was just fucking with you. And then that's it. Then we get the first kill of the movie. It's probably one of the best kills in the movie. And it's just a hanging. This uh, guy, uh, TP, he's out looking for Richie. And he goes like, oh, man, it smells like death. And then right when he's saying that, he gets a noose around his neck. And then hung from the tree. And I love that. He is trying to lift himself up. He's grabbing the branch above, trying to do like a pull-up so that he's not being hung anymore, so he can get like a breath. And then Madman Mars sees that he's doing this and grabs his TP belt and pulls him down so hard that it like snaps his neck and you hear that sound. It's pretty cool. Like that's a cool way to have a hanging kill in your movie. Usually it's just like they fall down and it automatically snaps their neck and we don't have this whole moment where they're trying to like, you know, save themselves. They or like they'll just they'll just give up and they're like flinging their legs around or they're just like grabbing at nothing. Like this guy actually tried his best to survive and I love that. You hardly ever see that in other movies. And then so then after he dies, of course, you know, Guy number two has to go out looking for him, and he finds his dead body and automatically suspects murder instead of suicide. Like, you know that he's been having some relationship issues. Maybe he's a sad dude. Maybe they broke up and then he went and killed himself. Like, it looked like he could have potentially killed himself. Like, I just thought it was interesting that he automatically went to murder. Like, somebody did this to him. There's no way he did this to himself. So I guess he knows TP pretty well. Like, he wouldn't kill himself. And then, you know, he avoids being hit with an axe like five, six times because Madman Mar Mars 
has a pretty shitty aim. That and he's just really slow with his movements. Like we see him running a lot, but then when he's like trying to kill them, he's moving pretty slow and he's also like really choreographing his movements, like letting them know, like, hey, I'm about to swing my axe at you. Like he's giving them way too much time to react. And then he finally manages to axe Dave, but it's an off camera kill, but we do get a nice payoff later on. So then Stacy, the girl who was blowing farts at a hill earlier, uh, gets in her car and you know, there's car trouble at first, so they're setting that up for later. And then Madman Mars grabs the door handle. This is a big hulking dude right to her side, like right there. And she doesn't see him. Like she has some bad peripheral vision. Like she should have been able to see this big dude right at her passenger door window trying to open up the door to get inside. But he's, again, so slow. Like if he was moving at a normal speed, he would have gotten inside that car no problem. Like, he would have been in there, but he's, like, going so slow. And so, yeah, so she drives away. Then she finds Dave's decapitated body. So now we know what happened when it cut away. He got decapitated with the axe. And I love how she, like, pulls up his body to, like, his headless body is in a, like, sitting upright position. And then she, like, freaks out, lets go. And then, like, five whole seconds later, at least... She looks back because she you know, she ran away. Then she looks back and his headless body is still sitting up on a log and slowly going back to the ground again. And then we see his body being dragged away. So I guess Mammy Mars finally decided to take his body to the house only after it was discovered by someone else, which is weird if you think about it. Like he was getting rid of the bodies right away before. Like, he killed the drunk dude, took his body away. Then he killed TP and left his body there to be discovered and then left this guy's body to be discovered and then took it away with TP. Like, I don't know, he should be taking them away right away after each kill. And so then, you know, she gets back in the car and, of course, it won't start. They set that up earlier, like three minutes earlier. And so now the car won't start, so we got that trope here. And I love that when she goes to fix the car, uh, she has her head underneath the hood, and Madman Mars sneaks up and jumps down on the hood, and it decapitates her. So we get two decapitations, but that was a pretty cool way to do it. And then when Ellie and Bill, her boyfriend with the bad, like, 70s porn stash, go to look for uh, Stacy, they try to start the car, and it won't start, so he opens up the hood, notices the blood, and the decapitated head right there in the engine. And I like that they used a real, the real actor's face there. They didn't use, like, bad, you know, dummy head. Like, they actually put the actor's head there. Um, so that was a good choice for the director, because when they have a fake head in a movie, especially in these days, it's always an obvious fake head if it's on screen for more than a half a second. So it was a good decision to use the actual actor there. And so, yeah, and then he gets back in the car. It finally starts. And then as they're driving away, Madman Mars, like, I guess is running very fast. I don't know how fast they're going, but I would imagine they're speeding off because they just found a decapitated head of someone they know. So they're speeding off, and he somehow catches up and pulls Bill out of the window that was rolled down. I think it would have been cooler if it, wasn't rolled down he like smashed through the window and grabbed him but he pulls him out we get this weak crash into a tree the way it was shot and put together is very weak and she like plops out of the car uh, ellie and then she looks back and she sees her boyfriend up in the air like uh, mars is holding him over his head and he's like bending him but we don't really see anything but we can hear his bones all like snap, his spine is snapping from Madman Mars's uh, brutal strength. Speaking of Mars's strength, I forgot to mention earlier that they set up this ax in a, a wooden stump that's like stuck there uh, and they just can't get it out for the life of them. And then Mars walks up and grabs it out, but he like struggles with it for like 10 seconds at least, like trying to get it out. He's like grunting, he's like, Ugh! I think it would have been more badass if he just walked up and was like, I got it. Like, took him no time at all to grab it. Because they were, like, two men, two grown men were pulling at this axe and couldn't get it to budge an inch. And then 
Mars manages to get it out, but it takes him like 10 seconds. I think it would have just been more awesome and it would have displayed how strong he is if it took him like one second to grab it out of that stump. So then Richie somehow manages to end up back at the house again. Like he's been walking in circles in the woods all night. How can you get that lost? He's been at this camp for weeks. How is he this lost? I don't understand it. Like, Just pick a direction and keep walking in that one direction like that band, One Direction, all right? Don't walk in circles. Like, how did he end up back at the house again? Why is he going back inside? He already explored it, I thought. He goes right back inside like a moron and goes in the basement and sees some horrifying image that we don't see until later. And, like, it, it's weird that it takes him, like, 10 seconds to, like, start reacting to it because he's, like, looking at the same spot like past the camera for like over five seconds with like hardly any expression. And then like slowly he starts to like uh, express more and more shock on his face. Like, oh my God, it was just weird. Um, but yeah, so it's like, how, how, I don't understand how he's getting lost so much. But then Ellie, she goes back to the camp and Mars catches up with her rather quickly. Um, and then she runs inside the fridge like she's Indiana Jones trying to survive a nuclear blast and, like, pulls out all the food. Like, Madman Mars is, like, maybe 15 feet away around the corner. He can hear all this food in the trays, like, the, the shelving of the fridge being thrown across the kitchen. And then she hides inside and Mars doesn't find her. Like, A, how is that possible? I, I would like to think that he didn't know, and he, that's why he's still sticking around later on behind the door, waiting for her to escape. Maybe he did know, but they make it seem like he didn't know. Um, but, yeah, A, how does he not, like, know she's in there and just kill her immediately? Like, open up the fridge, and boom, she's done. And, B, who in their right fucking mind would choose a refrigerator as a hiding spot? Like, jump out the fucking window like you're Gordon the dog, or... I'm pretty sure there was another exit in that building. There had to be more than one way in or out of that cabin. There's just no fucking way that that was the only door that he broke through to get in and out of that place. There's just no way. So after she stops hearing uh, Mars, uh, you know, running through the place, tearing shit up, like two seconds after the noise stops, she gets out of the fridge, uh, slowly walking around, and then when she reaches the door... Madman Mars is right there, and he puts an axe right through her chest. It's a cool bloody effect. We actually get to see, like, a close-up of the axe going through, like, a dummy chest. And, you know, you think she's dead, but I guess not. She comes back later, and we'll talk about it. Um, but after this happens, uh, Betsy looks through the window and sees her legs, you know, assumes she's dead, and sees blood all over the fireplace, and goes to the phone and doesn't call the cops. She calls Max. Like, what? That's a decision. That's just one decision of many that I don't understand from Betsy here. Like, and then we get the second questionable decision from Betsy here. She gets all the kids onto the bus. Smart. She's trying to save the kids. I like that. But then when she sees Madman Mars run across the road, she slams on her brakes as if she doesn't want to run over and kill this motherfucker. And then we get the car won't start trope again. Like, that's something you do once. Like, the car wouldn't start earlier. It's like, all right, fine. You know, it's a trope. We've seen it before. I can look past it. Now the bus won't start. Like, why is the bus having engine issues? It doesn't make sense. It's in it's such an inconvenience. It's such a, just a trope I can't stand. Like, and then we get her third weird, questionable decision here. She goes off to look for the others and leaves this, like, probably 16, 17-year-old kid with the other kids uh, alone and tells him to drive the bus. So I guess the bus got started again eventually. So now it's working again, even though it was just broken a minute ago. Now it's working again. And she makes this kid drive the bus. This kid who probably, A, doesn't have a license, B, wouldn't be able to drive a bus, um, and C, wouldn't even know where the fuck to go. Like... How far away is this camp from civilization? Is the police station like a mile away? If so, why wouldn't she just call the cops earlier? Like, she she just tells him like, you know, get the bus started and go to the nearest police station. How does this kid even know where that is? Like, when I was 16, 
I wouldn't know where the fuck everything is unless I had Google Maps. This kid doesn't have Google Maps. He's not gonna know where to go. So Betsy, she runs off looking for the others, uh, thinking that they're possibly still alive, even though she should think that more than likely they're dead. Because if they haven't shown up at this point, it's been hours since TP and Dave went out. She should think they're dead, but she's holding on to hope that they're still alive. And she bumps into who we thought was dead, Ellie, in the window, screaming for help, and she blasts her away with the shotgun. I love that. Was not expecting that. That was a nice surprise. So then she gets to Madman Mars's house, and she uh, gets killed, like, almost instantly. Like, he slashes at her face, cuts her face open, and then drags her down the stairs and puts her on a hook on the wall, like Texas Chainsaw Massacre, and we see the hook go, like, right through mid-chest. So she's done for. And she, before she dies, she stabs Mamma Mars in the shoulder, and he, like, knocks over a candle, so now his whole house is on fire. And we get to see, like, all the victims are hung up on the wall. Kind of reminded me of, like, the Mutilator um, from 1984, another great slasher. So, yeah, he just has all these victims down there, and we get to see his family. Uh, in the story earlier on, they said that, you know, not only did Madman Mars kind of disappear from the noose, but they never found the remains of his wife and two kids that he butchered. And now we see that their skeletons are on the wall in the basement. So again, like, no one thought to check Mars's house, really? No one? Or did they all, uh, did everyone that did go to check die? So everyone just kind of stopped checking after a while. Because the last person that went checking died, which is a theme in this movie. Everyone in this movie keeps going to check on someone else and dies as a result. And then this person goes to check on them and they die. Like, um, but yeah, I just thought that was a nice touch seeing the family skeletons down there and all the bodies on the wall. And I love that the, the final girl dies. Like, that's awesome. Like, how often does that happen? Usually they live. But in this case, nope. She gets hooked and killed and lit on fire, I assume, right? And then the theme song starts playing, and uh, Max arrives, sees uh, Richie, the guy who should have died in this movie, because he's really the cause of all of this. Um, he sees him in the middle of the road in shock, like, Mad Man Mars, he's back! And then, yeah, that's the end of the movie. Um, and they kind of leave it open if Mars is dead or alive, in case they wanted to make a sequel, I guess. Because really all that we see happen to him is he gets stabbed in his shoulder with the knife uh, that Betsy had. So that's it. Like, did he die in the fire? Or did he bleed out from that? Who knows? Was he ever dead in the first place? Was he a ghost? I don't know. So those are my thoughts on Madman. What are your thoughts on this cult classic slasher? Let me know in the comments below. And as always, if you like what you've seen here, you can hit this like button and become a subscriber today just by clicking on my cartoon face in about five seconds. And remember, it's all an opinion. You don't need to get butthurt about it. <laughs>